Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the IIEP webinar on uh, capacity, institutional capacity and leadership for gender responsive education. Now, this webinar has been organized as a, uh, in the context of the IIEP summer school of this year. Now, we have some people who are watching as the participants of the summer school, but this webinar has been also broadcasted and made open to the general public. Now, uh, we have the great pleasure to welcome Nora Files, the head of the UNGAI, the United Nations Girls um, Education Initiative. Now, Nora has been uh, working as a well, head of the UNGAI, but before that, she has worked uh, in the Canadian uh, International Development Agency, CEDA, as the head of the uh, education policy team and worked in very many countries, including Vietnam, Belize, uh, Indonesia, etc. Now, Nora actually coordinated this publication. Now, I'm going to show you the front page of it. It's a 160-page document, so it's much thicker than this. Uh, this guidance uh, that was published by UNGAI and GPE uh, it's called the Guidance for Developing Gender Responsive Educational Sector Plans. And today's talk is going to focus mainly on mod, uh, Module 5, on the assessing institutional capacity to address gender equality in education. By the way, my name is Miyoko Saito. I am the coordinator of the summer school. So now, with that said, I'm going to give floor to Nora, and uh, we're going to have about 15 minutes of a presentation by Nora, and after that, we're going to take some questions. So go ahead, Nora, please. Great. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. Now, I'm going to start by bringing up my PowerPoint presentation here so we can get going. Oops. There we go. So, Miyoko, is that up now? Oops, hello, Miyoko. Yeah, I'm going to assume that that's up. Yes, it is. Great, thanks very much. Okay. SDG 4 presents an ambitious agenda, equitable, inclusive, quality education for all. SDG 4 also recognizes gender equality as one of the foundational principles of this agenda. Education 2030 also provides some very strong statements about what must be done to achieve this enormous agenda, to achieve gender equality in education. It speaks about eliminating gender bias and discrimination and putting in place gender sensitive policies, plans and learning environments. In short, it states that the systems, education systems, must change. So now what will it take to do this? We could brainstorm together a long list, but just to start, let me share a few thoughts. This will require political will, but also technical capacity, targeted human and financial resources, revised policies and strategies, committed, determined people, teachers, administrators, statisticians, guidance counselors, unionists, and other education workers across the system, men and women, who are committed to this agenda. Now, in addition, we know that to deliver on this goal, it's critical that education systems actually work. They're as effective as possible. So that is why today we are going to touch on institutional capacity and institutional capacity reviews, which intend to provide information on the effectiveness of an education system and provide information on where improvements can be made. Today I'd like to speak briefly about three things. First, as I just mentioned, institutional capacity. Second, what would it look like were we to add a gender lens to institutional capacity reviews? And third, to reflect on the whole topic of leadership. Who will lead this agenda 
and this work. Institutional capacity reviews aim to assess the functioning and effectiveness of an education of education administration. By education administration, we referred basically to the public bodies, the ministries, departments, agencies responsible for planning and management of the education system, both at central and decentralized levels. A range of approaches and tools are used in this work. Some use scoring systems, others don't. Some use questionnaires, others employ focus groups. Some use external evaluators, others use self-assessments. Many of the tools, many of the tools are designed so that the measurement process is just as important as, if not more important than the resulting information. They may involve group discussions, workshops, or exercises. They may explicitly attempt to be participatory. This creates a possibility and opportunity for learning for the organization's members so that the assessment itself becomes an integral part of a capacity building effort. In education, the institutional capacity review can be a central part of sector analysis and therefore part of the education sector planning process or a standalone exercise, something in addition. So the kind of the core questions which we often ask are what are the norms and the rules and regulations which are, which are core to the education administration? And then what are the actual practices? Can we explain the difference between the rules and what actually happens? And what are the opinions or perspectives of the stakeholders, of those who are actually working in this system? This image, and we thank uh, one of Miyoko's colleagues for this image from a, a draft report, which will soon be made available publicly. This image introduces to us various ways of organizing this assessment, looking at if we start from the bottom, looking at the profile of individual members of staff, including their training and incentive for the work they do compared to their roles and tasks, assessing the effectiveness of organizational units that make up the administration. This relates, among other things, to their mandate, their structure, their internal management, reviewing the characteristics of public administration broadly, how, this, how education fits within the larger public sector and also looking at the quality of relationships that the education administration develop with external partners, national and international, who have important roles in the planning and management of the education sector. Institutional reviews can identify bottlenecks or problems in the system, and hopefully the cause of the problem, if not solutions. You're familiar with all of these challenges if, if you're working in this space, an overlap between the functions of the center or district levels, or inefficiencies in decentralization where the budget still is managed at the central level. Lack of funds, operational funds, to cover, for example, transportation at the district level, which can be a major problem, if, uh, making it totally unable for inspectors to visit schools. Or a mismatch of profile between the, of the education officers and the requirements of the jobs they, are, they occupy or their work mismatches the official roles. What they're doing is totally different from what they're intended to do. Or lack of standards for recruitment and promotion. Most important for our purpose is that although this is a, a very useful tool, this approach presents a narrow view of the education sector and is totally gender blind. It does not help us to assess the effectiveness of education management for gender responsive planning, policy work, or monitoring. Nor does it tell us anything about the gender issues in management, in the management of education administration. Miyoko made reference right off the top of this, this uh, webinar to the guidance for developing gender responsive education sector plans which UNGA has been working on over the last three years with the Global Partnership for Education. During the process, we sought to develop questions that would help us uh, bring an, a gender lens to institutional assessment. So we thought of different ways, different questions we could ask around the same three levels, individual, organization, and management. 
questions we can ask of individuals in terms of their competencies, their capacity around is gender awareness included in all or certain select job descriptions? Is gender training offered to all staff members? Or is it a required course for all staff and appointed officials? Is gender awareness included in job performance criteria? If we think about the, in, the organizational level, is there a unit or focal point responsible for gender in the Ministry of Education? And is there a budget dedicated to supporting this work? If yes, is the budget recurrent and sufficient to ensure integration of gender considerations across the education sector? and at different levels. Have any other resources or expertise, human, financial, or technical, been allotted or allocated to the focal point or to the unit? And finally, if we consider the management questions, of, uh, uh, in, which have a gender consideration, are there equal numbers or a rough, roughly equal numbers of men and women different levels of administration, different levels of, of management uh, across the organization? And are there processes in place to address any imbalances through recruitment, affirmative action, career enhancement? Is there a salary difference between what men and women get, earn? If yes, at what level of the system are these, are these differences significant? And is there any mechanism to address any problems which come up such as these? In our work on the gender responsive sector planning guidance, we sought to identify as many materials as possible that give us information about, about men and women in management across the education system. It was, although many of these are not available outside of the ministry, informa ministry information systems, this particular document or this, this image was identified as, as one of the uh, it was in a gender review in Lao PDR, and it shows the percentage of men and women in management positions at different levels. And not surprisingly, we can see the paler blue uh, um, color here indicates the number of men, uh, the percentage of men, and the darker blue, the percentage of women. This same situation where, where men dominate in, in, levels of, in management levels is, is documented in teacher unions, in schools across the education system. Even in countries with a majority of female teachers, proportionally fewer women than men rise in school leadership positions. The 2016 Global Education Monitoring Report Gender Review indicates that in most countries, the percentage of women in school manage management is very high in the pre-primary education and falls drastically at the primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary level, even in countries known to be gender responses, responsive, such as Finland. Now, as we know, the education system is a reflection of the larger society, of the larger society where women are also less likely to be in positions of political leadership, political leadership than men. Although in most regions, the proportion of women in legislative bodies has doubled between 2000 and 2015, men continue to dominate positions of authority. Only 20% of, of members of lower or, or upper legislative bodies are women, 19% of heads of state or government, and 18% of ministers are women. Now, this is of an interesting image, uh, pretty dramatic, and doesn't reflect all the numbers that I've just spoken about, but it helps us remember what we're talking about. So let's, let's just recap here and summarize where we are. The SDGs provide us with a vision, gender responsive plans, policies, and learning environments leading to empowerment in and through education. When we apply a gender lens to a review of education sector plans and institutional capacity, this brings us closer to a more focused agenda, which is to change education systems, rules, and behaviors to be more gender equitable, including greater representation of women in leadership positions across the education sector. And third, we bring to this women's lived experience as change agents in their communities, 
in political bodies, and in various positions in education. And examples of women's experience has been showcased this week in videos presented within the IIP online summer course and discussed very interestingly and very richly by course participants. So now, this, this is out of place, sorry, we're going to skip that one. Um, what kind of leadership is needed to bring about gender equality in education? What kind of leadership illustrates or models gender equality? What does it mean to lead differently? Drawing on the work of feminists from the global north and south, and in particular in this, this image, the work of Srilatha Bakliwala and Jedred work, I would like to share this model of leadership, which seems to reflect many of the ideas shared during the online discussion, which we uh, which is hosted by UNESCO um, over the, this week and the beginning of last, the end of last week. This framework applies a gender lens to leadership. What um, Srilatha Bakliwala calls feminist leadership for social transformation. And it claims not just to build the capacity of more leaders to be more women to be leaders, but builds the capacity of more people to lead differently. Her argument is first and foremost, leadership is about power. Holding power, exercising power, and changing who has or does not have power. We often think of leaders as one or a few high-ranking persons in pos or positions who claim most of the power in an organization, in which case power is not shared because being successful is competing to be number one. But this image of power can be different, can be perhaps shared power. You'll be familiar with expressions of power such as this one, power two, which is agency or capacity to act, to make change, that means skills and experience, insight. And the Prime Minister Portia spoke about that in her video that we saw this week. Another, another core concept is power over, authority, principle, like a principal in a school or minister in education, and control over people and resources. Now this can quickly slip into domination, but it can also be used for good. And power with, which I was alluding to before empowerment and enabling of all of those participating in the change process by and with the leader. Leadership is also for something, to do something or change something. It is a, has a specific purpose. Often, in our, in our case, it is, has a political agenda which aims to change unequal structures in homes, schools and communities. The very inspiring speaker from Kenya, who was in one of the videos this week, had a purpose to break down the barriers of Maasai girls in order for them to go to school. Her purpose and political agenda were pretty clear, allowed her to speak with purpose, with uh, authority and credibility. Leadership is also driven by principles and values. In the case of this feminist leadership for transformation, some of the values include equality and equity and inclusion for all, human rights of all people, basic right and entitlement to, to education, health, and other basic rights, democracy and accountability. The principles and value, these principles and others influence what we stand up for, how we make decisions, how we deal with conflict, what we are known for. And we heard on the online discussion some interesting comments which reflect the same interest in values and principles. I will quote a few of the statements. Women leaders have the ability to understand difference, different individuals, different situations, different perspectives. And another writer uh, in, uh, offered, women leaders can turn threats to opportunities without prejudice. The last, uh, the last concept, which is part of this model, is partnership. In this model, Leaders don't work alone, but in fact are very, very importantly, must identify both their strategic partners and allies, but also those who they need to work on to change their minds and develop partnerships in order to be more influential, powerful. I could talk on about partnership as that's what UNGA is all about, 
but I won't do so at this point. Now, we need to, to pause here for a moment to reflect on the fact that as working in the space of gender equality in education, we come up against deep structures of inequality. These are hidden and unspoken organizational and cultural norms and behaviors that often remain below the surface and be can come become sources of hidden power contributing to inequality, perpetuating inequality and exclusion. These are influenced heavily, sorry, these, uh, these, sorry, turn the page, there we go. These are influenced heavily, but not only by gender norms and power relations, but also other social identifiers in wider society, such as class, caste, ethnicity, and sex sexual orientation. I was struck as I watched the, watched the videos of women leaders and read the rich material shared by the participants in this course, as well as my reading of the experience of women leaders in other, in other literature how women's experiences reflect reflects the elements of deep structures of inequality which are common around the world things like statements like this people always resist doing things resistance and pushback is standard experience of women working in this space women leaders can be seen to can be seen to be difficult and dangerous by the by the larger society as they seek to change things and those who seek to promote gender equality also are known to, or people understand that they're changing or challenging the natural order of things, which has historically favored men in schools and bureaucracies. So there's a, a, there's a concern or a challenge of people resisting in particular gender change. We heard in the, on the, in the online discussion of, of various kinds of, of limits, social and cultural norms, which limit the ability of, of, of women in society making change and, and providing leadership. One author wrote, we must have strategies for women to be leaders because they perform different roles in society. I, we read about the low sense of personal capacity from a number of different online writers. One person said, we women are sometimes shy to take up some opportunities because we feel we do not yet, we may not yet be qualified or experienced. Sometimes unlearning the deeply held cultural belief that women cannot be leaders and must be dependent on someone else is a, one of the biggest challenges for the development of women's leadership. And I won't speak for any, at any length in terms of the, about the high levels of corruption or invisible info informal decision making, which can be a feature in organizations, which also provide difficulty for, for women who may not be on the inside of the informal or invisible decision making processes. Yeah. I was supposed to have that. So this brings us to a, a point of, of saying, where are we now? Well, I, I like to say that the SDG provides us with an actually leadership imperative of transforming our world, which is not a no small feat. But we come back to the question of who's going to lead this transformation? Who's going to be monitoring change? Who's actually going to be checking out whether or not we're moving the right direction? And I think it is going to be those around who are interested in gender equality who will have to step up and can provide leadership and ensure that we are on the right path. I'm leaving you with a statement from, from an author who speaks about leadership, not for leadership's sake, but for bringing together talents, women's and men's talents to address major social, political and economic concerns of the day. And for us, the one is gender equality in education. I'm gonna stop there, thanks Miyoko. No, 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Nora, for an interesting, very interesting PowerPoint. And I'm really, really thrilled to see that you are able to to use the uh, the materials from our summer school. Uh, you know, one of the uh, well, four of the threads where we have asked the participants to react to some of the videos that we have put on. So. Now, uh, I'm going to start with some of the questions that we have already received through the, um, the question and answer discussion forum of the platform. And then after that, uh, we're going to catch more questions that come through the chat channel. So the first question is as follows. How does one go beyond the gender rhetoric and actual, actually address the data, information, and strategic research requirements to monitor progress in terms of gender at subnational level? And what technical skills do countries require to be able to monitor progress at a minimum in developing countries, con context, rather than uh, the, uh, the industrialized con country context? So would you like to start with this question? Well, Thanks very much. That is a mouthful, to say the least. An awful lot of concepts have been introduced into that question. Um, let's just think about a few of them. One really important point, which is raised by this by this question, this person, is the difference between rhetoric and reality, and the other one between where the knowledge is. Is it at the central level or at the subnational level? Where is the expertise? That is a real. That's quite important in terms of our conversation today who is being trained to do what and whether there are there are tools and resources and approaches in place to to identify what is a good what is standard what is gender equality in education in our country look like what are the elements what are the what are the minimum standards we are looking to to recognize and to achieve in our schools and then how can we monitor against those minimum standards the question of, of whether this can happen at the subnational level is a really important one. I think that the members of the course might have an opportunity to reflect on that at, the, at some point. Because we often begin with the education administration, ensure that all those questions that I posed earlier are, are we have in our minds the people who are sitting in, in the capital city. To what extent are we also extending those kind of skills and, and about gender, gender analysis, but also about gender responsive monitoring, about indi how to create indicators uh, that are respond to, the, to gender issues, not simply parity, but also pick up the quality components of what's actually going on in the classroom and make sure that, that everyone is on the same page. Now, that does require quite an investment. There are models which have some level of effectiveness um, Ethiopia, for example, has a very um, wide and uh, broad structure of which is uh, of gender focal points from the central level right through to the classroom. And those individuals are tasked with collecting information on gender responsiveness of the school, how, how safe it is, uh, not only how many girls and boys are, are entering into the classroom, but to what extent their gender-based violence is occurring on the way to school and in school, and to report back, that back through a quite a substantial system. And that's connected into the EMIS system so that they have a mechanism to collect quite a lot of data. Now, unfortunately, it's very heavy and cumbersome still, and they're working out the, the kinks. But there are, I think the questioner is asking, you know, what will it take? It takes quite a significant investment and major commitment in order to put such a, a substantial system in place. Also, significant leadership. And to go back to my question about is there a focal point or administration or a unit who's responsible for gender responsive um, or just gender equality in the education system, Ethiopia has a designated uh, directorate in the central level, which and this directorate responds to the Minister of Education. So it has a well resourced uh, mechanism uh, in order to lead on this. Now, the reality is that it's underfunded, and uh, that's that's another whole question of education financing, which comes into into this discussion as well. None of this is cheap, but you have to pay for what you want to receive, 
and investment in mechanisms to achieve gender equality is also important. I'm sure there's lots more to say about that very rich question, but I think I'll stop there for now. All right, thank you. Um, yes, I hear that. Now, uh, I just go to the next question. Uh, in Mauritius, uh, generally girls perform much better than boys at primary and secondary level, and therefore at the tertiary level, there are more girls and of course, uh, well, uh, yeah, performing better. And that uh, at the uh, actually highest rank in decision-making positions are dominated by men. So what do you suggest or propose uh, should be done when it comes to developing a gender responsive ESP in this case? Right, well, this is, this is not a new question, although when we're seeing around the world, very specific environments where uh, where girls are succeeding in school and boys are are dropping out they're performing less well than girls and girls are succeeding through the entire system it's not consistent but in various parts of the world this is the case um, traditionally this has been the model uh, we have seen in central america latin america some parts of the caribbean and in fact the uh, the education the teaching body is also dominated by women in some some uh, parts of the of Latin America and the Caribbean as well. Um, being able to respond to that, that's why it's called gender responsive sector planning, is to identify where there are discrepancies, where there are inequalities, where we can see trends, where women or men, girls or boys are experiencing uh, our different opportunities and taking advantage of different opportunities in different ways, being excluded or succeeding. Now, the question is actually about what we call the glass ceiling. What happens that in spite of the fact that girls are getting into school, remaining in school, progressing through to the secondary and the tertiary levels, management is still in the hands of men. Now, that is almost beyond the planning, uh, an ESP planning um, potential. However, um, if the Ministry of Education decides that this is a critical thing to address, and that's probably one of the most important uh, barriers is a, as a leadership, political will and leadership within high decision-making levels of the government, then mechanisms can be put in place at least to ensure that women are represented in the management levels through affirmative action, through different processes such as the one that's taking place right now so that women get the training which is often a barrier to advancement in ministries of education. However, there needs to be not only systems which allow for women to succeed in management, but also uh, a change in, the, first of all, there needs to be a certain number. The, the rule of thumb is that 30% of the excluded group needs to be in the dominant in order for decisions to start to shift, for, for the culture to change. So there needs to be sufficient numbers of women in management in order for us to see a bit of a, a dynamic change. And also then it probably needs to be some other um, processes which allow men, men managers, male managers, to begin to reflect on the, the situation. Why is it there are only men in this, in this space? Look around and say, how come there are no women? Why, why are there only men on this floor? How come there are no women down the hall? Because it's their perception, their behavior, their attitudes, which also crowd in or crowd out women and make it a comfortable place for them to exist or not. The last thing is that this cannot be done alone by the education, by the Ministry of Education or the sector itself. This is going to have to be a, 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 a social change because I would bet you, although I don't know Mauritius very well, that if we went to almost any other sector, we would see the same, where the men are dominating management positions and decision-making places. So that this is going to have to be uh, a whole shift in the culture of the country um, towards acknowledging that there is a barrier and then developing mechanisms that I'm sure that the Department or the Ministry of Gender and Women's Affairs, uh, or however its name, would provide a bit important leadership and, and support around that. I'll stop there, Miyoko. Okay. I have to listen to that one to take it back to my uh, Japanese Prime Minister. Uh -huh. 
Um, okay, the third question, your guidance document. Uh, tell us that uh, having a cr uh, critical mass of women in decision-making positions in the political, public, and private sectors promotes an enabling environment for gender equality in a society. Can you speak specifically to the female educational planners' role, you know, their role in promoting this en enabling environment? Now, we're going back to the the education sector then do you have some specific message about their role in education yeah that's a really critical question i'm actually thinking that's going to have to be decided by the uh the women planners themselves i think it's extremely um beneficial to the ministry to have women planners i'm excited that there are so many uh, participating in this course the 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 what you're asking about is strategies strategies to make uh, effective inroads, to find opportunities for change, to identify who your allies are, and who, who needs to be brought on board in order for, for the kind of change you want to see to be taken, on, to taken up. I think it is actually quite an important uh, question in terms of figuring out who else you can work with, um, and keeping in mind, keeping your goal in mind. You are an education planner, you have a role and responsibility, you have a task to do, but what do you want to achieve through this, this work? Well, your own work plan, does it ask questions of gender? Do you ask yourself, through this work, how am I addressing, how am I shifting the, the, the uh, social norms? How am I addressing gaps? How am I monitoring change towards our objective, which is uh, an improved and increased gender equality in the system? I think that recognizing that this is your part of your 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 intention, um, and actually negotiating, perhaps negotiating with your your director, including something around making improving the mechanisms for achieving gender equality in education, as part of your your performance uh, and your your performance appraisal. I think that would be very helpful. It means you actually are kept to moving forward on this agenda as well as through your work. But I think the the fact that she has or he has raised this question uh, is critically important and very powerful because it means now you're going to be looking for ways of doing that. And I'll just repeat to say some of them are about strategies, who your allies are, what approaches are, are have demonstrated effective in, in um, by women's by women leaders across across many sectors, um, who you can who you can work with, who you need to actually get on board because they're a barrier within the system, and then taking it on yourself to figure out, to ask yourself and figure out how to make sure that the work you do is actually leading to this particular this outcome, which is where you really are hoping to see change. All right, These hard questions, Miyoko. Well, I'm asking a question. I'm only reading those questions that came through the this channel. So the next question is about IIEP. I'm not sure if you want to talk about IIEP, but uh, uh, this, you know, IIEP. Uh, we, as you know, we have a training program, and uh, we usually uh, ask the the people like the Ministry of Education nominate uh, the planners to come to train at the IIEP. You know, we, we encourage them to to nominate female planners if there are equal uh, quali qualification, etc. But then we have been always having a kind of a, a male-dominated mm -hmm. participants at the, the training program. So the question, which came from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, is that so how do you explain the barriers to you know the parity in participation? in this kind of IIEP's training and how can we address them? That's a really important question. Um, really appreciate that one. And I am reluctant to to offer thoughts on your institution, Miyoko, because you do an extremely important piece of work. But it is a barrier because one of your strategic um, goals is increased gender equality across the education system. So I appreciate, I, I know that you're committed to this and that this is an issue which you are, are actually trying to manage. Um, the reality is that, and this is one, uh, one of the things which we heard through the chat line and through the online discussion, 
is that women's lives are complicated. Okay? They are, people talked about the dual burden, the fact that they, when they come to training or when they're at the, at the office, they go home and they run another whole life afterwards. They have a full-time job with the rest of their work. Uh, they have complicated lives and that being able to find a mechanism to that to have that other life continuing when they're in Paris is a, is really tricky. So some of the some of the workarounds for that you have already you've already tried. One is the online approach, which I think I know I can't I don't know the statistics, but I would assume providing an online platform for women is more beneficial than perhaps for men because if women cannot travel then they are able to engage and learn and and participate in the course without having and they can do it at midnight they can do it when they're you know everybody's finally finished with all their responsibilities they can now get on to their training you heard from the prime minister portia the prime minister former prime minister of jamaica she spoke about making space in her very crowded life for training she had only could only not work one day a week and she got on that plane and she went the very first plane she studied all day she ended the plane end of the day she came back and she worked before she worked before she could get on with anything else she crammed it into her life although she had all these other responsibilities so i i have to say that i think it is a larger challenge for women and therefore for iip but as i say an online version a shorter course is probably better. I also think IIP could explore the potential of having regional courses which are face-to-face -face but not taking place in, in Paris. We know this has implications for not only for IIP, but for any kind of uh, career advancement or other training for women in country. They cannot leave their own space in order to go through their, uh, to be upgraded as, as more, more senior teachers. We know that women are more likely to participate in training when the training comes to them. Thus, figuring out what alternatives might be possible in your case to bring, to create a regional, every once in a while, a regional forum where people could not have, would not at least have to travel so far. And they might have the potential to be more, to participate more fully. I want to say one more thing and I then I'll, I'll um, let it go. But I think this particular course where women have been invited to participate provides an opportunity for for sharing which i think is unique and there is some safety in in the um safety in this particular model for women to share from their own experience without worrying about okay what are, what are men going to think about this now i think that that's a really good opportunity it's only it should not be forever but on this case i think it's a really interesting opportunity and it would be great to hear back from the participants how they have experienced it and allow you to do a reflection on your on the work of IIP and the type of training that it carries, it, it presents. All right, great. Thank you for the advice. That's great. Uh, just to, to add to, uh, you know, this testimony is that uh, Although there are fewer women at IIP uh, who come to be trained from the Ministry of Education, they usually are the best performers, which is a kind of thing to, to uh, just you know, put note on. Now, there are many, many questions that came through the chat channel. Now, uh, I'm just checking the time and uh, we have uh, spent about already 40 minutes now. If the time is still okay, I'm going to just uh, shoot one by one. Okay. How do we develop girls' academic leadership in math and science? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I just want to give a quick advertisement that a very large uh, learning symposium conference is taking place in Bangkok in two weeks' time, uh, led by UNESCO, on exactly this question. What do we know about supporting um, girls to better achieve in STEM subjects? Um, so there will be an awful lot of new learning coming out of that papers experience. And I would really, it's called crack, uh, how do we crack the code or cracking the code? Um, I would really recommend that you look to that conference and anything coming out of it because it's going to be a very rich um, dialogue and also a lot of papers and experience coming out. 
Now, the issue is that of all the subjects, we know that science and math, um, engineering technology are the areas where traditionally uh, women are not in the field as, as workers, uh, as professionals, and girls are less likely to, to find themselves comfortable at achieving well in those spaces. Now, what's interesting is with this is it's very much, um, the question is not what's the problem, but what to do about it. But to understand, to figure out what to do, you really need to re reflect on the problem, which is the expectation of uh, the social norms and expectations are generally that girls are less likely to achieve in math, science, uh, technology. And that, unfortunately, this social expectation um, is reproduced in the classroom. So teachers don't expect girls to, to perform. And guess what? They don't. Uh, parents don't expect girls to perform, to be great mathematicians, and surprisingly, they don't. Uh, a very large piece of work was done by OECD DAC through a re reflection on the PISA scores. It's called the ABCs of Gender, kind of an interesting report to look at. And they looked at the experience of 15-year-old uh, girls uh, who are at the top of their game in terms of uh, effective learning in math and science. And they asked them, do you see yourself working in this space? And they said, well, probably not. And they asked, they looked at the, the, the questionnaires of boys, boys across all the levels of achievement, even the less achievers in math and science. And they asked them, do you see yourself as being a scientist, a technic, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in this space? And they said, well, of course, I'm going to be a mathematician. So the expectation of what was possible expressed by successful girls, and boys across this field was extremely interesting and told us this has got nothing to do with ability. It has totally to do with expectations and what society provide, what opportunity society provides. So now how do we deal with this? We need to change the social norms in the classroom. We need to support teachers to drop, to unlearn their perceptions of what is the, what is the role of women in society and what is their potential as scientists, as mathematicians, as doctors? And therefore ask, present, uh, and present math and science as a possible area of, an al of study and of a professional development for boys and girls. Provide equal opportunities for them both. And also the last thing I'll say is we also need to highlight where we know women have been successful. We know that women, uh, that girls actually change their minds about what is possible when they see models of success in areas where they also have an interest. If they see women scientists uh, who may be coming from their same country, their same community, if they recognize and, and can put a name and a face on that, they are more likely to say, well, I can go there too. So the, one of the things that UNESCO is doing around this big conference in Bangkok is to highlight the experience of women in science, math, technology, engineering, so that remind us of what is possible. Right. Yeah. I was just going to mention that, that they are going to come up with this new publication of Cracking the Code, I think. That's right. The title of that publication and then they are going to launch the publication at the end of August in Bangkok so watch out for that now another question is uh, is there an African country that has achieved the gender integration in education I know I know you know <laughs> what are best practices to learn from these countries yeah that's a that's a tricky question I can't name one country that has been most successful. But we know that Rwanda has poured enormous resources into increasing the effectiveness of its, of its education system. And if we take parity, for example, as one indicator, an insufficient indicator, but one indicator, they have achieved great strides in terms of gender parity in access and completion across the, the three levels of, of, of education, primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary. They still have problems in terms of uh, learning outcomes, and we still see that there's some discrepancy in terms of whether all girls are learning uh, as well as all boys. And we see in some pockets there is going to be, there's a, 
um, inequality and that girls are less, uh, they're achieving less well than boys. We know that across the world, the biggest challenges are experienced by girls who are poor, from poor families in remote areas, who are ethnic minority communities, girls with disability. It's the most marginalized girls who are least likely to get in, remain, and learn. And so where there are pockets of exclusion, it's likely to be those who are the most poor girls in, 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 the mo in remote areas. And even in the best performing countries, that's the case. But if we look also to, we need to have a very nuanced understanding of what success means. Because if we look to South Africa, where again, we have huge numbers of women uh, succeeding in school, we also have enormous, uh, enormously high levels of violence and extreme difference between rich communities and poor communities. And so we know that in poor communities, poor girls are not achieving. And again, the, the, the um, context in which girls and women are in school as teachers and as learners are is very gender um, biased and that there is great violence and inequality in relationships within the school system. And so, we see on one side, one hand, uh, success in learning and uh, achievement in terms of progress to lots of professors in, in South Africa who are women, and at the same time, significant gender inequalities in society which are reproduced in the classroom. This would be a much, I'd love to have a much longer and more nuanced conversation about, about this. And in fact, I'd like to just reference also that FAWE is having a, a very large conference on girls' education in Africa taking place uh, in 10 days. And once again, you'll probably learn a whole lot more from that conference. And they will have a conference publication, which will summarize the findings and the, the, you know, the key points through the entire dialogue. And we should look out for that at the end of this month as well. Okay, just to, to compliment the, the word FAWE, you know, it's the four, oh, yes. four African uh, women. Women educationists. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. The next question. Is the representation of women in leadership as important as their skills in leadership? Aha. Now that question you're able to reflect on a little bit more fully later in the course because you have uh, a couple of days to spend thinking about that kind of thing. What we're looking for is committed, effective leaders not only women but men who are, have who are who understand power dynamics and are working for social change and gender justice so in fact we yes what is most important is the capacity and the competency and the awareness and style of women and men in leadership now because we there are fewer women in in leadership positions we would like to see an increase there but as I said at the out, somewhere along the line in my conversation earlier, we're looking for leadership to be different leadership, not simply capacitating more women, but bringing them on board to have a different approach and to have uh, be effective in terms of sharing power and enabling others in order to support a broad, a broad movement of social change and bring around gender, bring about gender equality in their relations and in the systems in which they work. How do you, how to address the resistance to change in societal norms that you mentioned? Yeah. Um, often, that's that's a day-to-day that's -day experience. That's a day-to-day -day experience by uh, men and women working for gender equality around the world in different areas and different sectors because it means disrupting the social in the social structure in which we have been living for generations um, to a certain extent we need to share with those who are disrupted by this an understanding that we're all better off and that the pie is larger when we have men and women uh, stepping up and uh, and engaging in this in this uh, this work together that is not one of deficit that when when women step up, men become less, have less space. There also needs to be a recognition that women need to be, um, I think, 
uh, conciliatory and to work collaboratively to demonstrate and model what gender equality in relations looks like so that none to reduce the the uh, desire to shame and blame and work rather to find common ways of common goals to uh, work around the pushback and also through to recognize it's going to be part of our part of our lives but also to uh, explore opportunities for collaboration with those who are pushing and find a common a common goal which we can work on together Okay. Now uh, we're going to have uh, either one more or two more questions, depending on the time. I think we have about five more minutes, or maybe less than five minutes. And so, Miyoko, yeah. I need to say that for every one of these questions, we as a community could have a very long conversation. I know. So you're just starting to open the potential of the, you know, the power of these questions, which are all very dynamic and interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Do you think labor market needs and workplace requirements are considered in assessing and creating enabling environment for gender equality? Question. Oh. So what do you think? To what extent do you think? Or you, you, you can say something about the needs of assessing and creating an enabling environment for gender equality in the workplace. Well, let's ask you a question of labor of looking at the labor market needs and requirements, and uh, as part of our understanding, our analysis of how we're going to achieve gender equality. And I think the point is the enabling environment in, includes the labor market as well as it includes the legislative and the policy structure of of the country. And or if you're looking at education, um, the, the, the legislation, the education law, the policies and the structure. Um, I think absolutely it's a necessary thing. What I do want to say, though, is that the labor, the labor market um, doesn't have equality as its as its driver. It is not looking to create gender equality. And therefore, we know of the. That's why we have rules for equal pay. If there were not rules for equal pay and equal, equal opportunities, then I don't think the labor market would be going there. And in fact, we know the feminization of the education, of the teaching environment has led to uh, a reduction in salaries at some levels. And where possible, some of the low fee private schools employ entirely women and they are, they are paid very little. And they work very long hours and have a perhaps sometimes have a higher quality. So it's actually looking at the dynamics of the labor market with a feminine with a with a gender lens allows us to know somewhat more about what we're stepping into and how to avoid the pitfalls of just following the labor market. But I do think the point is, should we be looking there for information? Absolutely, because it tells us very much about um, not only where women should be training in order to uh, find uh, opportunities, taking advantage of need, uh, but also alerting ourselves to the limits and the and the challenges that the labor market uh, puts in front of us, the and um, the difficulties and where we need to protect women's rights and other rights uh, to avoid being um, any kind of exploitation. Great. It's, it's really great listening to you. Uh, you know, there are many, many things that we need to be doing and, you, you know, we can be encouraged to, to implement different kinds of things. Now, uh, I think we're going to stop here. Uh, we would like to thank one more time uh, Nora for wonderful presentation, encouraging presentation for all of us. And I also would like to thank all of the teams at IIP who had made this webinar mm -hmm. possible. So uh, we will stay in touch and uh, until next time. Thanks very much, Miyoko, and everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.